Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Hey, man. Good morning, guys. Wow, we got a full house. We got some extra rows back there. How y'all doing? Good. Wow, a bunch of folks. You packed them in here this morning, buddy. Good. You know why we're here, right? The Bible says not to forsake yourselves from assembling together in order that we might stir one another up in love and good works. Please do yourself a favor. Make sure you're not just here because it's Sunday morning and this is the church you attend. Don't get caught in that stuff. <laughs> Don't wake up and do your thing and come here. And the first time you thought about Lord or made contact with him is when we sang. You get up and you live, Jesus. You put him on in the morning. You put him on so that you wear him. Amen? Yeah. And when you come here, it's so that we're all on the same page and we're focused and we're all running together and we're an army. You know, the Bible says, Jesus says, and I'm not being harsh and intense here on a Sunday morning. He just says, if you either gather to me or you're scattered. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. You gather to me, you're scattered. Let me touch that first part. If you're either for me or you're against me. I think we hear that and we think he's talking about a man that didn't get saved, a man that's a pagan, a man that's running wild, a, a sinner. But you can actually be a, 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 a tend to church and actually have an attitude, a perspective, a mindset, or a lack of understanding that actually works against everything God wants to do. So there's no middle ground. You're either for Him or you're against Him. You either gather to Him or you scatter Him. He doesn't say that's a person that does or doesn't go to church. It's a person that's living the kingdom. So Matthew 6, you seek first. Seek first, not second, first, not third, not way back. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And in, in that verse, he's talking about things we need, things that tend to drive people. He said the pagans go after these things. He said the birds and the flowers God's taken well care of. Aren't you more valuable than these? And isn't life more than worrying about that stuff? That's what he says in Matthew. It's amazing. The Word of God is amazing. It's so insightful because if I read it and I believe it, I'll never be destroyed for the lack of knowledge. I'll never let ignorance. See, we grew up here in a phrase like you grew up with a language like I grew up with, and it's anti-gospel. It's anti-Jesus. You heard, you heard stuff your whole life like what you don't know won't hurt you. You heard that growing up. Well, what you see is, see, you heard that here. <laughs> see, the, the, it's amazing. What you don't know won't hurt you. You read your Bible, it says we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge, and what you don't know is absolutely destroying you. And we grew up hearing what you don't know won't hurt you. What you see is what you get. You read the Bible, it says what you see is subject to change. Don't ever set your heart on it. The unseen things are eternal. Yeah. Did you ever hear this? Well, if I were you, I wouldn't get my... Man, you, you heard that here? Not here. Not here? <laughs> I mean in this region, not here. Pastor's like, ah! I don't teach that stuff. <laughs> well, guys, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hope on. Huh? <laughs> That's not you, is it? See, the Bible says, get your hope sky high, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 6 says that faith goes through the veil, passes through the veil into his presence. It's the anchor of your soul. Hope. And you grew up here, and if I were you, I wouldn't get my hope up. You know where that phrase came from? It's a self-centered, self-protecting thing. Well, I just don't want to see you hurt. I just don't want it's a, it's a self protecting thing. So Jesus took care of that by instructing us, okay, we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. We don't live for ourselves. We put off ourselves. We put off the old, we put on the new. So we don't have to defend and protect ourselves because we're not seeking things for ourselves. We're seeking things for his great name and the sake of others. We actually consider others more highly than ourselves and don't only seek our own interest but the interest of others. It's called laying down your life for another. It's called walking in love. It's called living the gospel. Are you with me this morning? Come on, let's make sure we're on the same page. We'll never be an army rising up. We'll be praying and interceding for a move of God. And the whole time he's saying, you're my move. You're my move. Get up and move. Go love somebody. Go make peace. Show some mercy. Don't complain. Discouragement's a lie. This thing isn't about you. It's about my great name and I put my life in you so you can make my name known to others. Yeah? He says, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's so many scriptures that are so amazing that pulls us out of darkness and into the light and shows us that we're in the world, but we really aren't of the world. And that's not a rah-rah, amen, Sunday sermon. That's a reality. 
that I'm waking up and I'm thinking different than I used to think because he transformed me. All things have become new. I have a new perspective. I have a new reason for being. There's actually a new fresh why in my life when I'm born again. There's a trap on the earth in Christianity where a lot of the mentality is that we're just coming to God for what we can get from Him. We're coming to God for what He can do for us. We're coming to God for provision and protection and for blessing. And then we'll shout loud in those sermons. But because of that mentality, there's a lot of discouragement, a lot of letdown, and a lot of people going to church that even question God and don't know who He even is anymore because of their life. And if you have that going on, you aren't having intimacy. You're not getting pregnant and giving birth to His children, meaning things that look like Him. Come on. Come on, that's not weird. That's just real. You can't be intimate with God. Look, if somebody's getting intimate long enough, sooner or later somebody's getting pregnant. Now, I've been with him. And if you look at me in the spirit, I'm about ready to push. <laughs> and that thing that comes out is going to look like its father. It's called bearing fruit unto God. It's called the work of righteousness. The work of righteousness is, is, is a fruit of a righteous judgment of God. So God says to Kevin, he says, I'm going to see you through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to wash you in the blood of my son. I'm going to see you as if you've never sinned, as if you've never strayed, as if you've never lived apart from me. I'm going to see you through the blood of Jesus that we always have been one. And everything I prepared, predestined, and planned for your life is who I see you to be and who shall surely come to pass. I love you and I make you righteous in my sight. That's the gospel. So then he becomes a tree of righteousness, the planning of the... This isn't our idea. He slayed the lamb before the foundation of the world. We didn't realize we're sinking. You get together and say, help! The plan was already here. The blood was already shed. The blood's already speaking. He makes him a tree of righteousness. Why does he bear the fruit of righteousness? Because he is righteous. Because he sees. He's forgiven. He's accepted. He's loved. He's empowered. What's he empowered? For the work of righteousness. So righteousness, righteousness is right standing with God. No sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Standing in the presence of God, unveiled, unashamed, as if you've never sinned. It's not an arrogant position. It's a humbling position. Because we all know where we've been and what we've done. And he says, I see what I created you to be. And I see what you're called to be. And I don't want you to look back. You're not Lot's wife. You're my bride. Look up from whence comes your help. Are you hearing me? So when you put on righteousness and you realize you're right with God, you start living in that place. It cleanses you. It purifies you. That's why Romans says righteousness has its fruit unto holiness. The Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. You don't do holy. You be holy. You realize you're one with Him and that He's in you. And you believe you're His Son. If you wake up and believe you're one with God, your life will start looking that way without you trying so hard. Because when you're trying so hard, you're taking tests all the time, grading your own scores. And your identity and encouragement rests on your grade. When you understand He's in you and you're not taking that test and you just start living in Him, you don't even have to take a test. You don't have to be concerned about your grade. In fact, if you're walking in a place and you stumble over here where your heart doesn't want to be, you'll see it immediately. Why? Because you've made peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ and you're sincere and the pure in heart shall see Him. That's how I work out my salvation. So the work of righteousness is very simply this. It's any manifested, made, seen, or realized uh, 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 fruit of God, the fruit of God's Spirit, who God is, His nature, His love, His tender mercies, His loving kindness. When that is flowing through a person's life, the way that it flows through God, that's called the work of righteousness. What made that possible is that God made you clean and put Himself in you. You can't love without God in your spirit. You can feel things. You can be emotional. Oh, I love you. I love you. And then we reveal that we have no idea what we're saying because now we're arguing. We're shouting down negative stuff. Come on. It's possible in the church to have children together and then not even want to talk to each other. 
And we called it love when we were making them children. We called it love at the altar and we had the bride and we had the Ken and Barbie thing going. But we didn't wake up and deny ourselves and pick up our cross and things got muddy and unresolved recon, uh, stuff and unreconciled stuff and all of a sudden things get blurry and we say, well, I fell out of love. No such thing. You don't live for yourself. What happens is we live for ourselves. We say, I love you and it's really I need you. That's why we say, don't leave me. Don't hurt me, man. If I left you, if you left me, I don't know what I'd do. I just, what you're saying is I can't live without you. There's only one you should say that to. See, because when your I love you is hinged on that motive, you're actually saying, I love you for me. It's needs driven. And it's emotional. And it feels real. But the fruit proves that it's deception. Love never fails. Love doesn't seek its own. Love takes no account, no account. Love takes no account of the wrong done to it. Then why are we so busted up by each other? Because we don't understand and we're in this for what we can get instead of what we can become. And we need to repent of that and go after God for real. Because I'm telling you, if we'll live this thing, church, look, I'm not scolding you. I'm not talking to a bunch of hypocrites. I'm talking to God's kids. We're here to stir one another in love and good works. And he gave me a mic. So you stuck with me for about an hour. And I'm jumping in the car and driving home. This might be my only shot at you. So I'm going to take a good one. <laughs> Get mad at me if you choose, but I ask you not to make that decision. Just humble your heart. And even if you're uncomfortable now, just at least keep your heart open. Because we're heading somewhere. I feel it. See how things shifted all of a sudden? See how nice I was being? And all of a sudden I turned into a madman. Setting you up. <laughs> wow, they said he was intense. He's pretty nice. <laughs> no, this thing is real. He gave his life for this thing. And I'm not saying that to militantly compel you. What I'm saying is it's real. you got to think of that. If Jesus is willing as God to put on flesh and come through the womb of a woman and be treated totally unfair and refuse to change and keep on loving and not change his mind about even the people that treated him unfair. Man, I ought to glean from that and grow and not just receive it as a blessing and a baby in a manger and a suffering Savior and yay, I'm going to heaven. When the bell rings, I prayed that prayer. No, life came in me. And a new way came in me. And the new way is called the. And it's him. Are you with me? Come on, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not mad. You know I'm not mad, right? He paid for this. He paid for this. Let's live what he paid for. You know, God is so good. If you bought something at the store and paid a bunch for it and it didn't work right, you're ticked off. You're back there taking that thing back quick. And you're mad. They don't make stuff like they used to. This is so cheap and I paid all this and I need my money. And if they try to give you 50 bucks less than you paid, you got an attorney already. wonder if God was like that and he's looking at you going, man, this thing ain't doing nothing I paid for. This, I paid a lot for this. How do, you, how do you value a vial of the blood of Jesus? How do you value a drop of the Son of God's blood? How do you value that? You're not going to find out in a yard sale for a quarter. How do you put a price on the blood of Jesus? But he put that on your head and he paid it. That means everybody in this room has the same exact value. Now, that's not motivational speaking. That's the flat-out truth. The trouble is people don't believe that. So they weigh themselves by themselves and compare themselves among one another and look at the world's way of thinking. And now there's hot shots and low life and there's people in the middle and just average. And uh, It's not true. Every person in this room can wake up in the morning and be in fellowship with God. Everybody can wake up and believe the gospel. Everybody in this room can wake up and pursue peace and walk in love and shine as a light. I promise you it's possible. We're going to find out one day when we stand before God that's what it was all about and it was possible and it'll follow a believer. Not a church attender. A believer. Not one that serves in a ministry. A believer. Not one that goes on a mission trip. A believer. Going on a mission trip isn't a qualification. The blood of Jesus is a qualification. 
Are we okay? Yes. Okay. I got two awesome brothers right on the front cheering me on. It's their fault. They're like, <laughs> so send them all the emails. Don't send me nothing. I won't read it. I'm not going to read it. I don't even check emails. Don't send me emails. Are you okay? Everybody in this room has this privilege. Why would the same price be on every head? Because every person has the same value and destiny and purpose in God. I'm not talking about specific purpose. I'm not talking about teaching children, missionary, musician, worship leader. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the same purpose, waking up in the light, walking in the light as he's in the light, walking in love. The common denominator we have, the unity of the faith, is that we're all supposed to understand who we are now that he came, and we protect that identity with faith. And no matter what we're going through, we don't let what we're going through decide who we are and how we are. We let what he went through find the truth in us. And all of a sudden, we face everything we're going through from that position. That way, we're never defeated. We're more than conquerors. We always overcome. Why? Because you don't grow weary and well-doing because it's not about you. It ain't about how you feel. And I can't believe they did that. Why is everything got to go wrong for me? And I don't know where God is. I'm going to get a break. No, that's deception. That's self-centered language. You're going to stumble for sure. You're going to misperceive God. And then you won't get close to Him and you never get pregnant. Are you with me? Yes. Selfishness, I talk about it all the time. I don't even think we understand how wicked it is. It's wicked. Selfishness is anti what we were created for. But it's what we were born into called Adam, so we must be born again. We've turned born again into a prayer we all pray off the back of that track to just make sure we go to heaven and don't go to hell. And Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross. Don't let sin against you produce sin in you. Don't justify evil and try to fight evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. You walk in the light. Pick up your cross. Why? Because you denied yourself. This thing isn't about you. You didn't incorporate him into your life. You gave him your life and he gave you his. It's a covenant. You're one with him. All of a sudden, you don't even have options. Watch this. wonder if you held yourself accountable and didn't need somebody to call you every day to ask if you read a scripture in your Bible. No, no, no. You hold yourself accountable and say, man, I no longer have permission to just be frustrated and not deal with it, to be angry and not deal with it, to judge people and not deal with it. That isn't what God made me to be. His, how he is. He didn't see me that way. wonder if he gave up on me. wonder if he said, oh, he'll never change. If he didn't change by now, he ain't changing. Well, he pushed me too far. Well, I'm done with him. Well, I can't trust him after that. Wonder if God spoke like that to us. Wonder if he wasn't love. You couldn't even pursue him. You couldn't even approach him if he wasn't love. But he is love and he made us for his image. And he said, follow me and the things I do, you'll do if you believe. So everything's after your believer. If you're the enemy, attack belief. Okay, if these signs follow those that believe and the things I do, you'll do if you believe and even greater things. If you were the enemy, wouldn't you attack what men believe? You better protect your believer. You better hold tight to that believer. You better make sure you have one teacher, the Christ, not the way that seems right to a man. Well, yeah, it ain't all like that. That guy's all hyped up. He's just putting on a show. He's just all dramatic. He's just trying. Now you yell button yourself right around truth. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. Then you'll stand before God one day and all the words you ever heard that were pulling you into truth, that God was wooing you into Him, all the words you ever heard will just pass by you and you'll see that all and be held accountable in the almighty presence of God. Ain't that something? You want to make sure you live your life so on that day you're guilty of one thing. I believed you and my life proved it. Not my church attendance. Not my preaching. The life I lived proved that I believed you. Man. He's real. He's coming. He's coming, man. Riding through the clouds. We sing that song and I'm going to make sure we're ready. Because we've been, we've been sold into this get something from him instead of become something because of him. 
So it's easy to be a Christian. It's easy to be a Christian. Just pray the prayer and you're in. And hey, we all got our issues and our ups and downs. And God understands. But just pray that prayer. Make sure you're in. That isn't the gospel. The gospel has come out from among them and be ye separate. Walk in a manner worthy of him. No man owes you a thing. You owe no man anything but to love. The gospel is be imitators of God as dear children and walk in like Jesus walked and love like Jesus loved who gave himself a sweet fragrant offering. Come on, stir in you. Stir. Yeah? Come on, I hope you didn't just come to church this morning because it's service time and this is where you attend and you like him or him. Or because your spouse makes you. <laughs> Man, don't, don't live that way. Don't do that to yourself. Let me show you scripture. You got to find it. Go to the book of James. We'll find it there. It'll pop up if we go there. Because it was there yesterday, so I know it's there today. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't change? The word's the same. Did you ever notice, no matter what you're going through, how you're acting, how you're feeling, and how chaotic it is when you open the Bible, the word's exactly the same. So why do we change so much when there's no turning or shifting or shadow in him? Why do we always say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how long, well, how long am I supposed to go about it? If you don't change it, I'm going to fall apart. Wonder if, could you see this? Could you see Jesus on the Mount of Olives? He's just hanging out on the Mount of Olives in the morning at daybreak, and the sun's barely up, and Peter looks over and says, whoa, the Lord, he's just sitting there. What are you doing, Lord? Peter slips up his side and puts his arm. He's, don't, yeah. don't put your arm on me right now. Just, I just need my space. <laughs> and Peter says, what is it, Lord? I've never seen you like this. I'm just, just thinking. It's just people, man. It's people. I mean, you don't, you don't even try to counsel me because you don't understand what it is to be in my shoes, okay? I mean, to do good. To do good, to do good again and again and again. And all they do is critique me, judge me, challenge me, test me, try me. They ain't sincere. They could care less about what I say. They just want their bellies filled. They want a blessing. They want healing. They want deliverance. They could care less about my word. And they, they're thinking all these things. God's let me hear their thoughts. I wish he didn't. It's challenging. I just, just I don't know. I'm just, I just need space, Peter. And don't even try to tell me you understand because you have no clue. I just, people are just bothering me, man. It's just like they don't appreciate a thing. And I don't even know if I want to go out there today. They're going to come and throng me up. <laughs> you know why that sounds ridiculous? Because we know him different. But he knows us different than we know ourselves. So it's amazing how that doesn't sound foolish in us. We actually understand that and try to counsel and cheer. Oh, well, you know, you just got to take heart. Let me pray for you to be comforted. Pray to be comforted. No, I want to give you a whole understanding, a whole perspective. I want to root that thing out of you that's allowing you to sit there. I want you to feel better. I want you to see clear. We're not living to feel better. We're living to walk in truth. Because truth makes you free. Feeling better doesn't. Now you're bound to feelings. And if you're not feeling good, you ain't doing good. If you're feeling good, you're doing good. If you can't stop thinking about it, you're not free. No, if you can't stop believing it, you're not free. That bad thing that's trying to come, you don't need it to go away. You just need to stop believing it. We think until the thought goes away, we don't have victory. Till you stop letting the thought influence your soul, you don't have victory. So if you're just waiting for it to go away, you're influenced already. And now it's still going on and you've been prayed for 45 times and eight weeks later, you're going, I don't know why this won't stop and God won't take it away. Maybe it's true. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) And if we're that easy, if we're that easy, Adam, the Satan's just slipping up on everybody's shoulder. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No, when he says, man, you'll never be nothing. What are you even pursuing for? Your life's no different. You haven't changed. Why are you so, why are you even going? Yeah, nothing's really different. What's really different? Father, I just thank you. You put something new in me. God, that little thing's reacting. And you just ignored it. It's cut off withering branch coming to nothing. Look what happens when you give people a microphone. They manifest. <laughs> Don't give him a platform. Come on. Don't be, I bind you, devil. I rebuke you. I plead the blood over my mind. No, put truth in your mind. 
You can walk the floor all day. I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood with my mind. Look, I'm not putting the blood down. I understand the blood. I honor the blood. And the Holy Spirit knows what I'm teaching, so don't you get offended. I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. And then the thought goes, dink. I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. Dink. The weapon of your warfare isn't pleading the blood over your mind. It's casting down every thought, every imagination that rises above the knowledge of God, holding it into obedience and holding it captive according to Christ. So who I am in Christ, acknowledging every good thing I have in Christ, is my answer. It's the weapon of my warfare. My fight isn't the devil. My fight isn't the thought. My fight is the good fight of faith, and I'm not letting go. Are you hearing me? Come on, we're so, we sell so cheap and we're not for sale. You'd be driving to work and, you, and, you, and you're a young girl and you put on your little purity ring at youth group when you were 14 and you were crying and it was real. And then when you were 17 and you were sure you were in love and you thought you were getting married anyway. You cried and you cried and you cried because it wasn't like you thought it was going to be. And you feel it and, you're, and you cried and you cried and God washed over you and your friends restored you and, and encouraged you. And all of a sudden you just feel clean again. And all of a sudden it's like you're not marked. You're not used. You're not. No, you made a mistake. But man, your heart sees it now. Painful lesson. Lesson nonetheless. I'm changed. But a year later, you're driving to work. And that memory comes, that flashback, and you see that picture, and it's like it's real. And you're like, why am I thinking this? I thought I was free. Thinking it doesn't mean you're not free. And then you know what we do? We grab our cell phone, and we call our friend for prayer. Because I just feel dirty. I'm just seeing this thing that I did a year ago, and I thought it was over, and I thought I was free, and I don't know why it's coming back. It's not you. The reason it's bothering you so bad, it's not you. You're not reminiscing. You're not flashbacking. It's, it's an attack. It's a familiar thing. It's coming to catch you at an opportune time and get you off guard. So you throw away everything you have in Christ. What am I supposed to do? As soon as you hear that thing and see that thing, you keep your eyes on the road and you just drive. Father, I just thank you that I'm clean and I'm pure and I'm holy in your sight. Father, I just thank you that you love me and you made me brand new. You washed me and you made me pure and I will never be the same. And I thank you, Father, I ain't looking back. I got a future. I got life to live. I got a destiny in front of me. And I thank you, God, that you made it possible because of the way you see me and the way you love me. Wow, it's so good to be pure in your sight. And that little thing sitting there going, what? And he runs back to the boss. Boss, I told him everything you told me to tell him. Yeah, and what'd they do? Gray out and get depressed? No, boss. Boss, you ain't gonna believe it, boss. Boss, they started to, they started to speak out to God. And he started to come in the car and I had to go. Boss, you fool, you couldn't have told him what I said. When you tell Christians those things and show them those things, they get grayed out, they get depressed, and they call for prayer. Not this one. Not this one, boss. I think this one. I think this one's a believer. Yeah. That stuff's happening all the time. Little things running around. You can't see them. There's snakes in there. And you bind into thoughts, feelings, memories, flashbacks. Then we're setting up ministries to deal with and minister to thoughts, memories, flashbacks. It's all deception. You're ministering to the central world of life. You're not even feeding the spirit. Get the lie ripped out by flooding people with the truth. You think I need prayer because I don't feel right this morning? Something's blocking me? Are you kidding me? Nothing can keep me from him. Well, it feels like, so what it feels like it. Lift your hands on purpose then and say, Father, I thank you. I have access to you. I thank you. I'll not be denied. Did you not love me? Send your son. Woo me. Draw me and fill me with your spirit. Thank you for loving me. That'll blow that stuff away. That sure beats, well, Lord, we're just asking you to make them feel better. <laughs> Show them why they're not feeling good, Lord. <sighs> You're teaching people to live sensual when you believe that stuff and not live by the Spirit. Ministering to flashbacks, memories. 
No, you tell people that's not who you are anymore. And the reason that thing's bothering you is because you've changed on the inside. And you can't go back and rewrite the pages of your book. And you can't go back and do it over. And you can't go back and get that day right. But you can get right. And when you change, you're no longer that thing you're remembering. And God will never see you for it. And he'll never mention it or bring it up ever. So why would you buy into a memory? You ought to lift your heart to God and thank God you're redeemed. And actually believe it. You always, that was good right there. That was the Sunday morning right there. Just bam. If you gave me the mic for that right there, that's a win-win right there, buddy. Because the number one way you're getting attacked is right here. It's right here. It's right here. And as soon as you think you're doing good, as soon as you're trying to move forward, as soon as you're trying to move forward, you'll have thoughts to say why you can't. You'll have thoughts to say why you need to still be. And boom, you've got to press that thing away and say, you know what? i got that value. i got destiny. The blood of Jesus shed. I'm going after God until I know him. That's what you say, young man. And you say, I ain't looking back because there ain't nothing back there that ever produced life. And I'm going after God and I ain't looking back. I'm not going to be Lot's wife and get stuck from where I was delivered and where I'm supposed to be and be froze right there. I'm going to get where I'm going because I ain't looking back. I'm looking up from whence comes my help. Are you with me? Let me read this James scripture because it'll still be here. It didn't go anywhere. He's patiently waiting. James is awesome. He's a man of God. He's patient. <laughs> I wonder if you'd open your Bible to the scripture you're going to read and it would say, too late. <laughs> Should have came five minutes ago. <laughs> I know that sounds wacky, but listen. Heaven and earth's passing away. His word remains. Probably ought to live by it. Probably ought to not quote it, get warm-hearted by it. Probably ought to actually live by it until the word becomes flesh. Because that's the only time you can actually say you know it. It's not when you quote it. It's when it's you. When you quote the word doesn't mean you know the word. It's when it becomes you. When you're making peace in your home. When you're toning down a harsh word with a kind word. Instead of adding a stinger to the end of your conversation. To pay back and end up winning the conversation. That's garbage. That's demonic. It's not cool to be in here. Praise you Lord. And then talking each other down when we're not here. It's not cool. Christianity is not church attendance. It's Christ-likeness. You say, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. That's the answer. Don't tell me that ain't the answer. You're a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Church, church attendance isn't Christianity. Being her is Christianity. Oh, I go to church? No, you are the church. So walk in love and walk in the light. Make peace. Show mercy. Treat your family like they have value, like they're worth the blood of Jesus, even when they're wrong. Why? Because what you're saying is what God said over you. I know who you are no matter where you've been. I know you have greater destiny than what you even realize. And I see you and you don't even know who you are, but I know who you are. And when I get in you, I know what you'll look like. When you're surrendered, this is worth paying for. I'm all in. And all it takes is faith to say, okay, let's go for this because nothing else has produced life. Think of the insecurity in the rat race of just trying to fit in. You can come to a church like this just to fit in. You could serve in a ministry just to feel appreciated. Now you leave hurt because you didn't get appreciated like you thought you deserved because of the time you put in. Now you have an offended believer because he's serving and it ain't love. He's serving for accolade. He, he loves when people say, man, we, we couldn't even flow without you, man. I don't know. You are a godsend. And you're like... And you heard him. You even heard him. And you're like, what'd you say? You're awesome. I don't know what we do. Isn't that weird? But you see people get offended in ministries. Because what they were doing, they weren't doing it because of love. Somebody owed them something because of what they gave. Owed because of what they gave. So they give this. Somebody ought to tell me I'm awesome. I give this. Somebody ought to give me a pound of back. Somebody ought to at least pull me up front. And why are they pulling her up? I've been serving in my ministry three months longer than her. See, they never pulled me up there. Warning, self-centered, looking for identity through what you do instead of who you are. Yeah. She's not leaving because of my preaching. It's way too good. She's just leaving because she's got a baby. It's not my preaching, so don't get any ideas. I'll believe God. I'll call you at the door, and I'll speak your life right out. No. <laughs> baby. <laughs> I'll, I'll behave. I'm sorry. <laughs> we got to get out of here. It's only 1124. Yeah, go for 
This is Joshua right here. He just turned back the sun for me. <laughs> See? See? You guys are in for it. No, I'm kidding you. No, I actually almost feel done. I know that doesn't mean much, but I do. Those feelings, you don't live by them. But I almost feel done. I almost feel like I said everything I need to say this morning. Because you, you got plenty to take with you if you wrap faith around it. You got plenty. But I want to show you just how wicked self-centeredness is so that we're convicted. So we don't just think light of having an attitude that's not producing life. Just arrogance, attitude, yeah, whatever, yeah, okay. Why would you even give yourself permission to internally live that way? If Jesus lived that way to you, you'd be so insecure, you wouldn't even know if you could approach him. If Jesus came in a room and people could rub him wrong, wow. If he played favorites, if he was biased and there was people he liked and didn't like, he just didn't like your personality. Wouldn't that be sad? You know, people say, well, I don't know about her. She's just, well, I know about her. She's created for God's image. She's predestined to be a daughter. No matter what she sees or doesn't see, God has a great plan for her. So we've got to not read a book by the cover and judge her according to the flesh, according to 2 Corinthians. We've got to see her for in the spirit. We've got to see her for destiny, not face value. Why? Because everybody in the room has the same value or the same price tag wouldn't be on your head. The same price tag wouldn't be on your head if you didn't have the same value. You go to Walmart and tell me the same price tags on every product. Every product has a different function and a different value, but the body of Christ has the same function. Walk in love. Walk in the light as he's in the light. Live sanctified and set apart. Everybody has the same call to pursue his image and manifest his image, to be trees of righteousness, the playing of the Lord and bear fruit unto God. We all have the same call, so we all have the same value. That's why we all have the same price tag. Ain't that something? He doesn't love some more and some less. Come on, we've been under pressure. We've tried to fit in. We've been insecure. We've had low esteem. We've been self-conscious. Fear of man. The thing I'm talking about swallows all that stuff up. None of that is the kingdom of God. Your will be done on earth as it is in... We always think that's miracles. That's the heart of God. There's no animosity in heaven. There's no backbiting. There's no insecurity. There's no identity crisis. There's no issues. Gabriel and Michael ain't sitting down with the father this morning saying, Hey, can you work this out with us? We... He's trying to tell me, and I told him, and it's just not. <sighs> it's weird. I use those examples so they sound silly. So we look and think, man, it should be just as silly if that's in my life. If I got Jesus sitting here acting him out, throwing a little fit and having a little rant and a tangent, and we think that's hilarious and silly and foolish because that's not, Jesus ain't like that. Why isn't it foolish if it's us when we're made for his image and the things he does will do? If we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If 2 Peter chapter 1 says we have exceedingly great and precious promises by which through them we partake of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through self-centered seeking. I got the word on this. I read the book. But better yet, believe it. I believe it. And it sanctified my life. Ugh. Remember that little pink note? Who was here when I read you that little pink note from my wife? That's pretty awesome, wasn't it? You know why I got that note? Because I live everything when you're not looking what I'm preaching. That's why I got that note. This isn't my theology. It's not my doctrine. It's his life in me. And it's your life too. If you'll follow him. Are you with me? See, because I ain't shouting her down. I ain't producing negativity. I ain't waking up and have a whole bunch of expectations on her shoulders and setting her up to fail me, and then she's my excuse and justification for the way I'm living. Well, I wouldn't be this way if my wife didn't. Well, what about you would be this way if Jesus is? Why are you letting your wife be the dividing factor, the dominant factor of your life? Why are you letting your spouse dictate who you are and how you are if Jesus is Lord? Come on, I've heard it countless times. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. We don't know what they put me through. We don't know how long it's been going on. You don't know how it feels. You're just every day, every day, every day. Yeah, and every day you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're focused on it and it's become your thing. It's your story now. It's your soap opera. You're not waking up fellowshipping with God. You're not feeling compassion and mercy because if your spouse knew who they were, they wouldn't be living that way. That's not provoking forgiveness in your life. 
You're just holding them to rightness and they're failing. Yeah? Yeah. It's called a counseling session. And if the pastor's not clear on what he's saying, he might even get caught taking sides. Well, you really should this. And you know, well, your husband, he's made a certain way and he needs this. No, he's made to be Christ-like. Come on, we teach this stuff in church. Men have needs. Women have needs. Make sure you meet their needs. That's not true. It's not the gospel. Because then when that's not happening, you know what we say? Well, they're not doing what I need them to do. And that's why I'm this way, because they're... Look, I went eight years married, but it was like I was single, because my wife just got a lie in her mind. And she just believed people said hi to her because she was with me. She just believed she didn't have any value. She was just my wife. I said, well, that ain't that bad, is it? (laughs) Just my wife. She's just my wife. She thought every hi, hey, Kim, so good to see you, was rhetorical and plastic. She started believing that. She started drawing back and shutting down. I'm a full-time pastor. I'm in love with Jesus. I'm in love with my family. I'm in love with people. I, I'm, I'm living Jesus. She starts drawing back. Honey, what's going on? Well, I just realized something. What? Because I saw what it was producing in her. It wasn't life. That's the barometer of how what you're thinking isn't God. If what you're believing isn't producing life, then you ought to relook that's at it. what you're Come believing. On. That's it. You better look at the fruit of what you're believing. If what you're actually believing isn't producing life, it can't be the Lord. It's a deception, it's a trick, it's a trap. It's the way that seemeth right. That's a little complicated because it seemeth right. But if it ain't producing life, it can't be. So she's pulling back, she's pulling back. See, my speech is so confident because I've walked through all this stuff. It's not my theology. It's my life. So eight years goes by, eight years, she's in this place. You say, eight years? Eight years isn't a big deal. Eight years isn't a long time. Tell me how eight years is supposed to change the truth. Why do we give time the power to change truth? We say we're in and surrendered, yeah, up to a certain time, up to a certain point. And then a man reveals he has a sellout point. But I'm not for sale. I've been bought with a price and I'm not my own. So when do I find the right to make a decision outside of love? When do I say, well, I'm just overwhelmed and can't take it anymore. Well, God didn't change her by now. Maybe he just doesn't want me here. Boy, I wish we'd stand with one another. I wish we'd walk through the hell with people. And and even if we find ourselves in hell, we know he's there. Because we surrendered and we're living for a goal. We're not living for convenience. We're living for a goal. We're not living for things to go my way. And I'm not needy anymore. I'm fulfilled. So I'm living out of fulfillment. So I don't need my wife to even be there for me. I love her. How's that for straight talk? Because counseling sessions don't sound like that. Well, you know, it's really hard, Pastor. It's been going on for six whole years. And I'm a pastor. And I got a lot on my plate. And people are pulling on me. And then I go home. And I don't even have a wife there that encourages me or can love me. I mean, do you know how long we it's been since we even, I mean, Pastor. <sighs> Don't you even try to sell me that stuff. That stuff is lies. That's called taking yourself into account. That's called taking account of a suffered wrong. That's called seeking your own. That's called loving your own life. Not loving not your own life. But Jesus, what Jesus says is, man, she doesn't know who she is. Forgive her, Father. She doesn't know what she's doing. God, she has such a greater destiny. God, if she saw you clear, if her eyes were clear, her body before light. She's not. There's deception. There's darkness. Wow, she needs you so much, and you're in me. Now's not the time to be a frustrated husband that needs counsel. Now's time to shine. Now's time to cover her with love and cover a multitude of sin. Now it's time to let mercy triumph over judgment. I love you. Yeah? So then she goes eight years, and now she doesn't even want to go to church. So I'm full-time pastor, and my wife won't come. She's staying home. She's saying it'd be better if I die. I'm a crack uh, uh, a kook, a crack kook, or whatever she would say. She'd say this phrase that wasn't pretty about her. She was a loony, and I can't get it right. And I'm like, stop, that's not true. We can get it right. I'll walk you with you through it, honey. We were... Ah, you'd be better off without me. I said, I don't believe that. It'd be better if I was just dead. Uh, 
So you look at that. Wow, pastoring, full time. Your wife won't even come to church. She wants to die. Suicidal. Come on, if I don't understand truth, I'm a mess. I'm questioning my own life. I'm questioning my own ability to be a husband. I'm letting her weakness flip over on me, and now I'm taking a test. I didn't promote this lie. I didn't provoke this lie. It's just a lie that came from hell, and she bid on to it. It's not a reflection of me. It's a reflection of what she's believing wrong. How many times have we done that? And all of a sudden, we take the reflection. The thing's going bad in our family. Our kids make a wild, bad choice, and the parents feel like failures. And If I'd have done better, they wouldn't be doing that. That's not necessarily true. I think the prodigal son had a good father. And he took off and went on the lamb, man. I don't think it was because of his upbringing. I think because it was his own desires and he was drawn away by his own desires and tempted by his own desires and it gave birth to sin and brought death. And the story wouldn't even be a story if it wasn't for the father in the story. We always call it the prodigal son. We subtitle it the prodigal son. It should be amazing father. Yeah? Because if we don't have the father, there's nowhere for him to go. He just messed up. Bummer. Now he lives in regret like the world that has no answer. Man, I shouldn't have. Why'd I have to? Man, if I wouldn't have. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I shouldn't have. Oh. And he'll eat you up. Regret produces death. 2 Corinthians 7. Isn't that something? My wife wanted to die. So she almost got her wish, but not quite. She went into a violent seizure for one hour. Severe brain damage, life support, coma. They said, we think she's going to die when they called the house. Went in and we laid hands on her and prayed for her. And God raised her up. An hour and a half later, she woke up off the respirator with zero brain damage. No seizure activity on the EEG. And God saved my wife from that lie. And when I walked in the ICU room, she said, hey. And she just got off the respirator and I said, hey, you. And she's sitting there in a little hospital gown. She just came out of a coma. And I said, you, I started crying. I said, you have never been more beautiful. And she said, really? (laughs) And I said, honey, I'm not talking about the cover of a Cosmopolitan magazine. You're alive like she should be. And she said, what happened? She didn't even know. And I started to talk to her and tell her. And I brought up about how she's been saying she wished she would die and how things tried to take advantage and make that happen. And and then she went, she went, (gasps) because she's believing that if she dies, she's believing if she dies, it's a gift to me. She's believing that. And it hits her. She's sitting there and she goes, oh, it was so funny. She goes, (gasps) You held on to me. You held on to me. You didn't let me go. You didn't let me go. And I said, no, you're not going anywhere. Just held her. She said, I love you. (laughs) See why I get them pink notes? I'm a Jesus husband. I'm not a husband. I'm a Jesus husband. My wife had eight years of deception. And actually thought some crazy stuff and acted crazy. She told me that was a tormented, dark, messed up season in her life. And she looks back on it and knows how bad it was now. And she honors me and loves me because she knew that I wouldn't change my mind about her. She loves me for it. Why? Nobody loves God first unless they see his first love. That's why we better preach the gospel clear and stop making it about the carrot we can get. Man, I'm preaching good in your church. Yeah, amen. Are you guys all right? So then God began to walk her out of that. And the only struggle she had for a while was feeling condemned when my children did things out of sorts because she felt like she empowered it and it was her fault because she wasn't there for him and sent an opposite message. So we just talked her and walked her through that and trusted God's mercy and God's redemption because who knows that sometimes that can be true. Who knows that sometimes you lived in a season and actually gave a negative influence to your children. When you realize that, it's not time to get condemned. It's time to put your faith in God and believe he's a redeemer. Because now you don't want to live that way. And if you saw what you saw now, you wouldn't have done what you did then. So the mercy of God is greater. And there's a thing called redemption. So you trust God. 
with your children instead of take the hit in your soul. Are you with me? It's just crazy how quick we're just to be condemned and know oh, if I was a better parent or oh, if I was this and that. You know, if we were more believers, we'd see God's glory all the time. So I want to read this to you and it'll be, oh, it'll be almost the close. <laughs> James chapter 3. Who is wise? Uh-oh. Question. Who is wise? Just check the color of their hair. No, no. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show by the conduct, the good conduct of their life. Not their sermon, not their seminar. Who is understanding and wise among you? Let them show by the good conduct of their life that the works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Watch this. But if you have bitter envy... If you have self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. Don't portray to be something you're not. Deal with it. Don't put on a mask. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't ignore it. Don't say, oh, well, everybody has their stuff, brother. No, that's why you have yours without conviction. Because you believe it. Come on, I'm, this is not my sermon. This is the word. I'm just reading. Do, do they ever put it up here? No. no? Okay. Okay. They don't put it up there? You got to have a Bible with the church. Okay, good. No, that's good. You don't do that? No. Okay. I was only going to do it for one reason so we could all read it together. That's all. But if you have a Bible. Okay, good. Oh, because that's your training around here. Dude, I'd love you more. <laughs> You're awesome. You guys. It's good, man. You really do that? I love you more than more. That's amazing. Let him show by the good conduct of his life that his works have done the meekness. If you have bitter envy, if you have self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not Descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. Where there is envy and self-seeking, existing, confusion, and every evil thing is present. That's why you got a spouse praying for a spouse, and it's getting worse and worse, and they can't hold together, and it's getting worse and worse, and the spouse that's praying, that's staying in church, going to the Bible study, is getting even worse and worse, and in turmoil and torment, and we think it's just because she has to live with him. But it's because when she's praying, it's self-centered. She knows if God would heal or change her husband, it would go better for her. And she's mad, and she has pain, and she's angry, and she's praying because she's fed up. And why do I have to always take the reins and lead? He's supposed to be the spiritual head. And when she's praying, it's not compassion and love and mercy. There's self-seeking in it. So here you are actually praying like you're praying to God, moving in earthly, sensual, and demonic motives. It's Bible. My wife prayed for me to change for 13 years when we got married. We got married, I told her I was a Christian because it worked. Because she just got saved six months before we met. So when I met her, she said, you're a Christian. I said, well, yeah, I grew up in church. I went to VBS, man. But I had one thing on my mind. I was 19 and she was 23 and I thought that was cool. And I thought, this ain't no girl that I graduated with. This is a woe man. And I had one thing on my mind, and it wasn't Jesus. I remember I tried to make that thing happen early on. She said, what are you doing? I said, what am I doing? And I kept trying to do it. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean what am I doing? She said, we're Christians. Well, I wish we all got that. And then I played it cool. I was like, oh, yeah, look. And I tried to comment, oh, I'm sorry, it's just what you do to me. You're like, you're just, you're all that. <laughs> and she didn't want to hear that. She just wanted me to stop. We were engaged nine months. I made her cry a lot, bringing her into compromised situations. She said, I'm never going to sleep with you, Dan. We're not married. I'm a Christian. I have a new life. I said, you're not going to sleep with me? 
So I, I thought if I couldn't hit a home run, I'll be a good hitter. I'll get a good average. I'll get singles and doubles. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll bounce one off the wall and get a triple. I might get thrown out at home, but I'll get a good average. I'm just being real. Is it all right if I'm being real? So then I'd make her cry and make her cry and make her cry and do it all at her expense and tell her it's because I loved her. Lies, that's lies. It's self-centered deception and I don't even see the value of the woman I'm doing it to. I just see she has something I want and need for my flesh. But I love you. It's not a compliment, ladies, just because somebody wants you. It might be just because they're itchy. Doesn't mean you're beautiful. You ought to hear how we talk growing up in locker rooms and bars and stuff. Stop buying into some lie. It's not a compliment if a man wants you. He might lust you. You live your life, women of God, to be a prize to be won. And you say, well, there ain't no man out there that's Christ-like, so make a draw on Christ in a man. What are you going to do, compromise because he ain't out there? And cry yourself to sleep? See, I had a young lady at church I was pastor, and she slept with this boy, and she came in crying again on my lap. I took her upstairs out on the picnic table because I knew it was going to be messy. And I talked to her stern, and she said, Stop it. She freaked on me. Stop it. I know what you're going to say. You're going to describe this Christian man. You're going to describe this man of God. And she started saying what I was going to say. And she said, and that man is not out there, Pastor. That man is not out there. And I reached in, I squeezed her arm because she was freaking out. I squeezed a little harder, squeezed a little harder. I didn't hurt her. I just squeezed a little harder and got her attention. She's like, wow, I am screaming at the pastor. <laughs> and I stayed gentle and smiled. I said, so he's not out there. He's not out there. So then you compromise, sell cheap, live short, violate your conscience, and come in here and meet me again and again and cry. And build a resume of deception, defilement? Or do you position yourself in Christ and become a prize to be won? You become so valuable in the eyes of a man in love and true sincerity that you draw on Christ in a man. So if that man ain't out there, find him through your life lived. And let Christ come up in him to where he's willing to lay it all down to love you. And she said... And she stopped freaking out on me. <laughs> yeah. You got bitter envy, self-seeking in your life. Don't boast against the truth. You're lying. The wisdom of that is not from above. Earthly, sensual, demonic. And where that exists, every evil thing. So I told you about my wife. 13 years she prayed for me. And when, when, we, when our marriage ended, because we, we're together, 40 years, May 1st, 40 years. First 13 Terrible. Last 27, heaven on earth. That eight-year period, heaven on earth. My kids running wild, heaven on earth. woo Never even thought about asking for prayer. Never even dreamed of going to an altar. <laughs> heaven on earth. Yeah? I'm not a man with a problem. I have an answer. I don't find my identity through my wife or my children, so I'm okay. I'm on the earth to love them, to be there for them, support them. Not to get hurt and broken by them. I didn't wake up to need them. I woke up to be like Jesus. <laughs> See, this is the stuff I found in my Bible when I read it. The wisdom that's from above, that's what I want. That's what I really, truly want. The wisdom that's from above. See, you have to make sure this is what you want. See, not everybody wants to become loved. They find a reason in their heart to not become loved. Well, I'm not going to, nobody's going to make me a doormat. Well, you tell me of somebody and they're painting analogies while I'm preaching in their head and they're drawing lines and putting chips on their shoulders. Not everybody wants to become loved. But it's the goal of our instruction. But not everybody wants to become loved. They want to hold on to the rights that Adam gave them that they never had from God. They want to hold on to human reasoning and human wisdom and the court of law, so to speak. And the talk show mentality and the victim and the villain thing. It's a weak and petty life to live because you're justified in the lie, but you're dying in it. And you're not even convicted to change. And all of a sudden you're this way because of this and this and this. No, you should be this way because of this and this and this. 
There's a difference. I hope you're hearing this morning. Because this wisdom from above, it's first pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's willing to yield, and it's full of mercy. It's full of good fruit. It's without partiality. It's without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to those who make peace. Did you get that? Close your eyes with me, please. Just close your eyes with me. Don't be distracted, please. Just close your eyes. Even if you're not a believer and even if you don't like me, just please, trust me, just close your eyes. And let me read this and just let this sink in. The wisdom from above is first pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle and willing to yield. It's full of mercy. Good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I'm going to keep reading. Just keep your eyes closed. I'm going to close with this and I'm going to be finished. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. He can do whatever he sees to do. Therefore, as the holy elect of God, the reason he's saying therefore is because we just put off the old man in Colossians 3 and put on the new man and he's renewed in knowledge according to God's image. Here's the image. As the elect of God, you put on tender mercies. You put on kindness and humility and meekness. You put on long-suffering. You bear with one another and forgive one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you forgive. But above all these things, church, put on love because it is the bond of perfection. Amen. I'm finished, Pastor. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Can we just close our eyes? Lord, we we see your word and we hear your truth. God, I've been praying the whole week that if there is correction in my heart, in my mindset, let the truth dismantle arguments, ideas, strongholds, patterns in which I think that it's not even the gospel. Let it be brought to obedience to the cross of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that this morning as I just, I just brought a Dan, the word of God, the truth of the gospel has fallen and I've been scattered and sown in this place. I thank you, God. That the enemy will not be able to snatch it. He will not be able to choke it. God, we thank you that it will bear fruit unto righteousness in this house. 30 and 60 and 100 fold for your glory. God, I pray that everyone that's sitting here and being challenged by the word, that you give grace to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, my goodness, I just have a hard time to shut a meeting like this, but, but God is good. Listen, guys, we're going to transition. Uh, uh, I'm going to do something that I kind of been forbidden to do, but I feel this in my heart. I really do. I just feel it in my heart. Uh, this is something that, well, let me just speak the truth here. Dan, from the first moment I met him, he just been on my case of not at all making any deal about the offering. It's been so awkward for me because I'm just honest with you. I just want to tell you my heart because it's not the way speakers speak to me. So 
It's been beautiful. I've learned so much, learned so much of ministry and being a servant of Jesus. But in my heart, I just feel the Lord is uh, not because he needs this, because I want to. I feel this in my heart. Uh, Bill and Bob, can you just bring the offering baskets? I know. I know. I know. I just, I know. I'm, I'm just, this is, I'm afraid. <laughs> just don't send it back. God will keep you accountable on that one. I feel led by the Lord. <laughs> this guy. Lord Jesus. We just want to bless him. He's all the blessed. Amen. We just, we just believe in the fruitful ground. And we want it so. So uh, can you just, as you feel that, please bring what you have in your heart. Thank you for coming. Seriously, thank you for saying yes. That's right. Jesus, we speak your blessing of a brother Dan, his wonderful wife, his children, his granddaughter. God, we just speak your blessing over them as he has poured into us. May you pour back into him. And we pray for safe travels. And we pray, God, that as he travels around this nation, God, may you continue to use him to shift a mindset in the body of Christ. That this thing is about you and about your glory. And we pray that we will be able to shine because a light has come. And that the glory of the Lord is already risen upon you. Come on, if you love him, say amen. 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 Bless you and have an amazing Sunday. And we'll see you again. Love you guys. Thank you so much.